And it's great to be back here on a sunny Saturday here in the Delaware Valley in a uh, very cold one. <laughs> yeah. I'm man. Brian. I'm Lee. And this is the Brian and Lee Show. And it's good, really, to be uh, in a warm studio. Yes, today. warm and toasty. 28 degrees out there. <laughs> it is. And some snow is on the way. We had snow yesterday. Yeah, we had a little bit of snow, but it was mostly uh, freezing rain. We have uh, we have a great show for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about everything that's happened in the last week, and we have a great guest that uh, is on uh, on the guest line today. Olympia Lapointe uh, is. Uh, if you've seen the the movie Hidden Figures, uh, you know what that's about. You know that uh, it's about uh, African American women who are rocket scientists. Uh, and uh, this happened during the uh, 1960s. Mm-hmm. When we have Olympia Lapointe is a real rocket scientist, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, she's on the guest line today. She's a TED speaker, an author, uh, very successful. Her first book, Mat- um, Mathophobia. Um, was was a, a success, and she has a new book coming out, Answers Unleashed, and uh, it's great to have uh, Olympia on the uh, guest line. Olympia, good afternoon. How are you? Hey, how are you, Brian and Lee? We're Thanks doing great. Me. You're welcome. We are doing great. Uh, we kind of wish it was um, the weather was kind of like it is in your neck of the woods. Oh, wait, wait, so I'm over here in Los Angeles, and you guys are in, where are you guys? Oh, we're broadcasting in uh, New Jersey, but we go to Philadelphia and Delaware and New Jersey. Oh, oh, that's so wonderful. East Coast. East Coast, East, East Coast. Coast yeah. 28 degrees today, Olympia. I'll see, well, is that a good thing? That sounds like a good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got spoiled last week with like 60 and 70 degree weather. Yeah, yeah, it was it was 60 and 70s last week, and today it's uh, 28 degrees, and snow is coming uh, on Tuesday. So, uh, no, I'm ready. For, I'm ready for springtime. You know, we're ready for oh, springtime. Yeah. <laughs> so. Y- y- you know, I uh, I went online. I went to your TED talk and uh, went to your website, and uh, you have a fascinating story. Uh, um, it, 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 I think it really it resonates with me because um, you know we have a similar background in in the fact that uh, I grew up uh, in poverty, and so did you, and and. Uh, y- it's about your story is about overcoming those obstacles and becoming very successful. Um, so you know, t- tell us a little bit about your background and um, you know uh, how how did you become a rocket scientist? Well, that that's a great question, and uh, I I actually shocked myself too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, I. I'm very fortunate. I had the ability to have a great career as a rocket scientist for nearly 10 years. I helped launch uh, Discovery, Columbia, Atlantis, and Endeavor space shuttles with 28 missions successfully launched to space. Uh, But people are really shocked because I did not come from a prestigious background. I was never geared to go into rocket science or do this type of work and to later use the mathematics and science in my research that I'm doing now within the human brain, I was never actually geared for that. Rather, I was a uh, 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 young kid who grew up in South Central Los Angeles, a very impoverished neighborhood, and I literally had to find a way to be able to take care of myself and, and survive in an area that that was literally um, a, a place where people sometimes didn't come out alive. Uh, I mm. grew up in South Central Los Angeles uh, to a family where I had a single mom. She took care of four of us by herself. And um, it uh, was really challenging because we sometimes didn't have food to eat. And there was often times that I would go to school just for a, a meal. And I was just so thankful that I had a meal. Uh, we lived around gang violence. And um, there was one point in time where my mother had went back to school uh, at nighttime, she struggled because she didn't have an education, and so she went back to school at nighttime to attempt to get her associate's in arts degree. And then we were in the 1980s time frame in Los Angeles, so there were crack houses and, and drug places mm. that would come up, and there was a uh, drug house that 
establish itself right next door to our home. And we uh, were scared. And I remember our mother, she put up sheets of metal. This is to give you an idea of how dangerous it was where we were growing up. She put up sheets of metal along the wall. And so she had to sleep in a certain direction. So if the bullet came through the wall, it would first hopefully hit through this sheet of metal. And then it would miss our head. That's mm. how it was. And uh, she was so... Uh, disappointed that she had to end uh, going to her night class so she stopped going to her night class so she could be at home with us so we'd be safe and, and I always saw how important an education was for my mother because she didn't have one and I valued uh, education and I always told myself no matter what I was going to get an education and then when I went to uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory when I was six years old on a soul trip I saw the I saw big jet engines and I saw the mission control room and I thought to myself I wanted to be just like the men who launch rockets that I saw um, on the uh, pictures on the wall and I had no clue that I was a young uh, woman of color looking <laughs> completely different like all the men that I saw on, sure. the, on the pictures but I, I didn't see that I saw potential and that's what I held on to and I didn't realize that that intention of becoming a rocket scientist was going to be like uh, an app if you will like you know how you have the cell phone app it was mm -hmm. like an app sure. running in the background of my brain for years mm -hmm. and it was that intention that actually helped me carry me through and I did not have the easiest life uh, I later on was transferred and bused into a school in a completely different area where there was better education uh, but then I found myself failing algebra and geometry, uh, calculus and chemistry. <laughs> well, that, that, <laughs> and I have to laugh about it now because yeah. I became a rocket scientist, but at the time it was devastating. Uh, but uh, looking back, uh, I'm very happy that happened because uh, there was a teacher that volunteered to his time to help students understand the mathematics, and I caught the bus to to school on these days that were off, that we were off just so I could get tutoring from him. And so that was the aha moment where my brain unlocked, where mm. I realized, hey, I'm actually smart. I can actually retake classes in which I didn't understand, and I can finally get this. And what I realized in that experience is that the only thing that was stopping me was myself. Mm. And later I became uh, a mathematics major and went to California State University, Northridge, where I later became uh, one out of the top five graduates out of, six, out of a 6,500 graduating class. And I later started working for the Boeing Company as a rocket scientist. And I started the Boeing Company when I was 21. Wow. 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 And, and, and you were there and you were one of the, I guess, maybe the only woman there, um, or, or one of the few? Well, to give you a, a ratio, uh, this is from my own personal experience. I remember walking in into a design room, uh, which, uh, it was a design review, so there was like the experts of the top experts were invited to this briefing, and I was invited, and I was very honored because it took a while for me to get there. And out of a room of 200 people, I looked around, and there was only one other woman. Oh, boy. And wow. And that was, that was just one meeting. There was other meetings I went to where I was the only woman. And that was just the ratio that I personally experienced. I can't talk about every other ratios and national data, stuff like that. That is what I experienced, and that was around 20 years ago. It since has changed. There is a couple more. I would say that probably now, out of the room of 200, you may have five. Wow. <laughs> so there is definitely an opportunity that we have existing to be able to prepare not only women in sciences, but anyone who is interested in it, because I, I'm a firm believer that the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is such a beautiful way for us to innovate this nation and, uh, and the world. And so we have definitely opportunities to be able to increase those numbers. So we have everyone going into those fields. So, mm -hmm. so ha have you seen the, uh, the the movie Hidden Figures? Oh, have I seen the movie Hidden Figures? Yes. Oh gosh, when I, I'm going to tell you something, and uh, uh, and I'm going to tell your audience something as well. Mm -hmm. When I was actually scared to go see the movie Hidden Figures. Really? Uh, honestly, really? I'll be very honest with you. I was scared. Um, I knew of 
every single day when I went to work, it was a challenge. And it was a challenge because I realized I was different. And the, the biggest challenge was communicating not only with a different group of people that didn't have the same experiences, but communicating the science in a way so it could be respected uh, no matter who it was coming from. And and I every single day I woke up and it was very challenging for me, but it was a decision that I made every single day to go to work and to be the change that I wished to see. And when the movie Hidden Figures came out, I was actually scared because I was actually scared to relive what I went through. And mm. when I actually had enough courage to go to see the movie, I remember sitting in the seats and tears ran down my face because that was my epiphany moment to realize that I was not alone. There were three other women that went through what I went through in a different degree. However, they opened the door for me to be able to be an influential person in science. And had it not been for these women, I wouldn't be in what I do right now with being able to help people understand the importance of the STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Yes. And I was so moved by this film that when I watched the film, I realized I was looking at the screen and Katherine Johnson's life was exactly like my own. And I thought to myself, this, this, this is unbelievable. And I was so just inspired. And, and that's the most amazing thing. At first I was scared to go. And then when I left the film, I was inspired. <laughs> and I was so inspired that I ended up staying up all night long until 7 a.m. the next morning wow. writing an article about what I experienced while watching the movie and posting it on the Huffington Post. And that article spread like wildfire. And I'm just so thankful to have been able to share my own personal experiences on how it mimicked the film so people can see that this was a true life experience, not just by these three individuals that were in the, the movie, but myself as a modern day hidden figure. And, and I think that's so your your story and and, and certainly the, the 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 film is so inspiring and so important because you hear um, when people talk about education today they talk about what are the obstacles you know uh, the problems with uh, people in poverty and and and. and Typically, it is well. Let's let's give more money to education, and, and there's nothing wrong with money. You know, there's nothing wrong with financing. Um, you know, good teachers and and books and things like of that of that sort. But money is not going to solve all of the problems of in education. Um, there, there there is something else that is uh, perhaps missing. Well, it's. It's interesting. Um, just like business, a business cannot survive unless it has three avenues of strength mm -hmm. within the administrative side, within the, the marketing side, and within the product that it creates. There's no way that a business can grow unless it has the strong support group in those three areas. Education is the exact same way. You have to have a product. The people that you invest in, the people in which are going to be the next generation, the product is the people's education and knowledge that comes out at the very end. How much do they know? Do they know the basics? What is this information that everyone should know? That, that's the key thing. That's the product. The product is the people who are enlightened. Then you have the administrative side. You have the side that has the ability to, to create structured systems that will allow the facilitation of education to increase. So this is when you have um, uh, you have standardized, sometimes certain standardized tests, or you have uh, criteria for students to not just stop with mathematics when they're in the, uh, once they complete Algebra 2, but it's actually mandatory for students to have it all the way when they go over to their senior year, just like English. So you have the administrative side, but then you also have the marketing side, and that's where you pull in people outside of the company to invest in what it is that you're creating. And so that aspect with being able to pull money in and from other individuals, that's just one side of the equation. The two other most important sides is making sure we are generating the next generation of people who will become confident. And that's not just 
becoming confident in being able to know certain facts, but it's being able to read information online and be able to know when something is versus hearsay and something is opinion versus when something is facts and being able to have critical thinking skills to know when something's fake news or when something is real. Mm. That's the, what, the opportunity that we have to prepare the generation to be able to think on their own and not be given something as, as if it were their own thoughts. Uh, absolutely, yeah, I, I, I I agree a thousand percent with you uh, on this, and and we're, we're talking today to Olympia Lapointe. Uh, she is the author. Her new book, Answers Unleashed, is coming out in August, I believe. Is that correct? Answers Unleashed. Oh, Answers Unleashed. It's coming out in August. August, yeah. All right, looking forward to that. Yeah, Let me tell you. Uh, so. My background is similar to yours. I grew up poor. I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, we didn't have much money. I, I grew up with a single mother. My, my father died uh, when I was five years old, and she was raising three kids on her own. Uh, we, we existed from uh, Social Security and and so we would get a Social Security payment every month and out of that had to be the bills had to be paid and and uh, food had to be bought and uh, so we didn't have a lot of money so um, and and with that there there's when you're when you're poor and I discuss this with my my sister a lot when, when, when you're poor uh, we really we knew we we didn't have a lot of money we didn't have a lot of things but because we had a family unit and and we were loved uh, that gave us an enormous amount of strength and uh, the strength to do and to go beyond what our monetary material things the limitations of material things so do, do you feel that way too well, um, it's interesting. Um, it, I, I really value your background, and I value my background, and we each have our own backgrounds. And what I, I feel, I feel that no matter what we go through, it's happening for a reason. And there's always uh, it, there's always a benefit in the situation that we may not be able to see at first. And like uh, your experience and how you had that that family background, uh, there's always some sort of blessing in every single type of hardship. And I think when people recognize that, they become empowered to know that they can handle anything that they've been given. Uh, for example, uh, we were in a very difficult place uh, growing up, but that was a blessing. <laughs> I mean, this may sound silly because... Yeah. Uh, like on Fridays, uh, there was gang initiation day, and so we'd have to be concerned about wearing certain colors because mm. if we were walking down the street with certain colors on, we would be a target in certain uh, situations. And so with Friday was the day everyone wore black to keep from being a target for gang initiation times. But that, uh, this may sound really peculiar to say, but that was one of the best experiences because, really? one, I learned how to be able to watch out for my surroundings and make sure that I'm always safe in any type of environment. And it's been able to be helpful for me no matter what country I've gone to, yeah. uh, where, no matter what place I've gone to speak. I've always been able to be aware of my surroundings. And that was a, a gift that was brought to me in that particular situation. Uh, uh, just uh, by the type of clothing you wear, you become very conscious on how you can communicate to people based on what it is that you, how you present yourself. So it, it was actually a strange thing, and, and it also showed me the value of an education because when I was in this environment where I saw people uh, who didn't have an opportunity, it was simply because of how they viewed their life. When I was blessed into the other area, the people who were successful were the people who viewed their life as important who viewed their lives and viewed their purpose as being important. And if we can instill that not only in other people but in ourselves, that's when we change our life around. And that's what I was really happy about. One of the things I, I find interesting about your story is that you failed <laughs> uh, you know, uh, math courses early on, mm -hmm. but it didn't, it didn't destroy you. It made you stronger to go on and, uh, and, and, and continue with oh, math. Uh, 
do you know what? When I failed math, I, I, and I loved math. I always loved math. And don't get me wrong. I loved it because uh, <laughs> the first time I ever really encountered math is when my sister was showing me. Now, my sister, my oldest sister, she's actually faster at mathematics than I am, but she, she chose not to go into engineering, which is really peculiar. <laughs> but in any case, uh, she was really fast at mathematics, and she actually first introduced math to me by baking cookies. <laughs> she showed me how to bake cookies and double the recipe, and that was the first introduction to fractions and stuff before I had ever really learned it. And I always loved math because it was always precise and it always told me the truth. No matter how I sliced it, it was always going to tell you the answer. And it was always going to point you in the direction that was going to give you a solution. And that's what I really loved about it because there was no guesswork with it. It was no interpretation. It was. So I always liked it, but when I encountered mental challenges and difficulties, and I write about this in my book, when people experience emotional challenges, the first place that they see it is in their mathematics education. Mm. Mathematics is the one subject where you have to use the frontal brain lobes to actually do the problems. Mm -hmm. You have to be grounded, you have to be alert, and you have to see what's right in front of you. Otherwise, you cannot at all solve math problems. And if you can't do that, that means that the fear part of the brain, the reptilian part of the brain is firing because the frontal brain lobes that are responsible for solving math problems has to be on and the only thing that turns it off is fear and they don't operate at the same time in the brain mm. so for me when I was going through all these emotional challenges I was experiencing fear and as a result it was shutting off my frontal brain lobe and I was then failing my math mm. and I was I've been I failed algebra and I, I and it's so funny I, I failed algebra I failed geometry I had to take geometry over I took chemistry uh, and then I felt that, and it was because I was still struggling emotionally with being able to turn the fear off my brain. And, and when I learned to turn that fear off, that's when I succeeded in mathematics. And I was so shocked because when I started helping other people through the, through the math educational programs at California State University uh, in their math programs when I was an undergraduate, I was seeing that everyone was going through the same thing that I went through. The fear was shutting off their brain. And I was just so compelled to share my own experience on how I overcame my own massophobia and helped other people do the same thing mm -hmm. that I wrote the book Massophobia just to share with people how to actually turn off the fear so you can solve your problem. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I, you know, I, I, I math was... Uh in college, I uh, m math was was a problem for me, and, and mostly because I was a, I, I never did well in math, uh, so uh, I uh, that fear in the back of my mind was I, I can't do this, you know, I can't I can't do algebra, I can't do statistics, uh, and uh, it was it, it was a struggle for me. Do you, you think know? that was fear or frustration? Frustration, well, and and fear because you. you you fear that yeah. you're you're not going to make it. You know, you're not going. Yeah. It, it's going to yeah, be exactly. hard. It's, it's a little bit of both. I realize that fear uh, comes up as four different characters. It comes up as Quincy the Quitter, which is primarily frustration, mm -hmm. and that's when the sign that the brain, when you experience frustration, that's a sign that the brain is wanting to reach shift, but it's just not. <laughs> and then, then there's Donna, the overdoer. She'll try and try and over obsess about stuff. I think that's like most uh, yep. most overachievers. And mm. then there's Samuel, a struggler, who is somebody who will just get really angry because he can see the answer, but no one can understand how he's getting it. And then, <laughs> and then there's Crystal, the criticizing that will point fingers at everyone for her poor performance. And we all fall into those categories at one time or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, 28, 28 missions, rocket launches, uh, 28, that's a lot over a 10-year career. Uh, and, and you're talking about having life or death uh, situations, you know, because um, what you're doing is, is you know, you're, you're responsible for calculating is there going to be explo uh, what's the likely the probability of having an explosion on on on, on the rocket um, that's that you know that, that that's uh, 
That's mind-boggling to most people. Yeah, that's quite a responsibility to anyone. You know, so how did you deal with that? You know, with with the fact that um, not all not all rocket launches go successfully. That's such an amazing question. I'm very happy that you asked that. And um, if I can let you and your audience inside my brain and my thinking and my feelings here at this moment, okay. uh, it was scary. Mm. Um, at first, when I uh, 28 missions is a lot of launches. Um, I was involved with them in some degree or another. There was a good handful of them I was actually in supporting mission control. There was a good handful of them, uh, of them I was signing off on engine tests to verify that there was going to be no explosions that would kill people, literally. Mm-hmm. And then a handful of the, the missions I was there calculating information to, to show what the risks are uh, each time we launched. So it was different capacities for each one of the 28 missions. And honestly, it was one of the most intense, exciting, and stressful jobs I have encountered so far and I'm and I I'm still young so I'm sure I'm going to encounter really amazing things even more so for my years coming up but uh, there was nights I, I couldn't sleep mm-hmm. there was nights um, there were some nights where I worried about uh, an analysis and I would literally be wake up in the middle of night thinking about okay maybe I should do this analysis on it or maybe I should research here to, to see if this is going to work uh, there was times in which, um, and literally, if we were launching, there was times in which I reported into work at 1 a.m. in the morning and stayed until the next day all the way into, well, actually, 1 a.m. in the morning and stayed a good 15 hours later sitting in one seat looking at data in this dark room before we launched. Uh, there was times in which we were doing engine proposals where we were getting uh, new contracts for new engine designs that were that were um, not privy to the public. And so there was times in which I literally worked overnight to make sure we had information to provide uh, to NASA. And uh, it was very, very challenging. And each day I went to work, I realized that I, I was going not just for myself, but I was going for a larger purpose that I did not understand. Now that the Hidden Figures is out, now that um, I am in the media, it's so fascinating. And now that I can look back, I realize that I wasn't just there for myself. I was there for every single person that hoped to be able to be a change in the world. And I didn't realize that my decision just to do that was going to be so monumental in shaping the experience of everyone else to realize that they can do what it is that they want to do too. And and that's being involved with that type of project and that success, it builds, every success builds on, uh, each success builds on itself. So, you know, um, do you feel uh, that having done that, having... uh, you know, been through 28 launches and uh, having them uh, um, been successful, do you feel that you can do almost anything? <laughs> well, you would think that, but no. No. No, no. <laughs> you would no. think I'd be an expert in everything, but no. Uh, do you know what I realized? There's people who are really good at some things and there's people who are not. I mean, <laughs> and there's, 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 uh, there's, then there's a group of people that decide to be good at something that else that they are not used to. Like, for example, this may sound really silly, but for the longest time, uh, I operated with the logical side of my brain, the left side where I was solving problems, getting mm-hmm. things done, and I didn't know how to use the feeling side of my brain. And, and we each have that, we each have that ex- expressive feeling uh, emotional side to us that drives us, that creates that passion in us, that makes us decide to go ahead and do something. And I had been working so much with the logical side, I forgot how important it was for me to build the emotional side of my being. And that's actually part of the reason why I wrote and write the book uh, Answers Unleashed, is because I realized that 
there's three parts of the brain that needs developing. You, we can't just simply think that all of our life issues and everything will be solved if we're logical. No. No, no, <laughs> and that's no. what I had to realize after leaving rocket science. I had to realize that there's three parts of the brain. The, the first part that people really do not realize how powerful it is, it's the, what I call the faith sector. And I write about this in my Huffington Post article, The Tree of Brain. And the faith sector of the brain is responsible for seeing a future before it physically exists. Yes. Now, all athletes do this. Yes. They see themselves winning. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, we see um, the, the, a person, we see inventors seeing something created before it's done. That's actually yep. uh, the part of our brain that uh, makes us alive and it connects both the left side and the right side of the brain together. And, and it connects the brain to the rest of the body through the nervous system. And we don't give that as much credit on how to build that up. And then we also have the logical side that, that helps launch rockets and, and do, creates all this amazing type of analysis. But there's also the emotional side that kept, keeps us wanting to do what it is that we are passionate about doing. And so when we build up all three of the sides of the brain and actually connect them, that's when we find answers in our life. And we're able to find answers on our own, not depending on other people. And that's how we can actually reshape our brain. And I'm really excited because I share about this in my work. Uh, I share about this online in the Huffington Post articles. I have the Answers Unleashed um, information online so people can go check out uh, the different experts that we have that are doing this. And I'm just uh, so thankful because uh, I had to become a beginner again. I was not good at, at expressing my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, and how, so you're, you're starting out in a, in, a, in a new avenue. Uh, you're trying to strengthen that part of your brain. And how do you go about that? How do you admit to yourself, hey, I'm not good at this. You know, uh, how do I become better at it? What, what's the first thing that, that you, you do? Oh, well, the first thing, it's like, it's, it's, I, it's like a... Uh, the first step always is to admit that you need help. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. You gotta admit that you need help. I, I I don't know how to do everything, and that's what the biggest thing for me to have learned about my own self. That I may have launched twenty eight rockets, but there's things I don't know how to do, and I need help. And I think that once we recognize we have the capability to do anything we set our mind out to. But we all, at some point in time, will become a beginner at something. That's when we are empowered, when we can actually ask for help to get things done. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Uh, we're talking today to Olympia LaPointe, and uh, she's the author of Mathophobia. Uh, her website is olympialapointe.com. Uh, go check it out. There's lots of information on there, videos and articles and interviews, and uh, it's terrific. And it's great to have you on uh, the Brian and the Lee Show today. Oh, my gosh. Answers Unleashed, what's the focus of the book? Uh, Answers Unleashed is helping you reshape your brain and unleash your brain power and erase the, the negative memories that you have experienced. Mm. Mm. That's, that's the key thing. Once, when we realize how to actually erase the negative experiences that we've had, and then we can actually rebuild the three parts of our brain, which is the left side, the center, and then the right. Once we do that and connect all sides together, that's when we unleash our true brain power. We can launch rockets. We can become a billionaire. We can do anything we set our mind to. But we have to know how to unleash the natural ability that we've been given to use through our brain. And, 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 and you know, uh, I, I love I love brain science. I love uh, uh, the research that's out there, and because I've been using it uh, all of my life to help me to improve, to succeed, and you know, it, it's it, it's important because the the negative uh, talk that you get from other people uh, and. and 
is not as as important as the negative talk that you give yourself. That, that you know, so you have to learn how to kind of. Um, overcome your own negative talk you have to program your reprogram your brain and i know you 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 talk about that uh uh in uh, your ted talk and and uh it, yeah. it, it's important uh, i'm so happy you watched that and and for your your audience members um thank you so much for bringing that up uh, the TED Talk reshaping or, or the TED Talk is reprogramming your brain to overcome fear. And uh, in the talk, I talk about there's three ways to actually do that. Uh, we have to first name and reject the fear. We have to reprogram our brains with different thoughts, and then we've got to take action in direct opposition to our fear. And so that the talk, I'm very thankful it's online. Uh, oh, nearly a million people have watched it, which is like amazing. I will go somewhere and say, "You're the TED." And then you have the TED Talk about the brain. I'm like, what? You saw it? Thank you. So, I mean, this is this is great. And I had no idea that that TED Talk was just a piece of the equation. And so the, the book, Answers Unleashed, deals with the other side. Removing the fear is just one part. Then mm-hmm. you've got to replace the, you've got to replace that space in your thoughts with something that's new and more powerful that will charge you for decades to come. And that's the trick. Once that, once you actually remove that fear through naming and rejecting your fear, through if you're Quincy the Quitter, Donna the Overdoer, Samuel the Struggler, or Crystal the Criticizer, then you've actually got to reprogram your brain with different thoughts. Like, for example, um, I, when I left Rocket Science, I thought I... I, I didn't know that I could do something other than rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have to laugh at that now, but when I all I knew was rocket science. Mm-hmm. You know, but I didn't realize that I was equipped in, in business. I mean, I knew how to solve problems and I knew how to communicate and I knew how to, to put things together. And so I had to replace that thought of, okay, uh, when I left rocket science, I had to replace that thought of fear of, oh my God, how am I going to be able to support myself with, no, I am a businesswoman and I have an important message and I'll be able to help people. I had to hold on to those thoughts and instead of the fear-based thoughts that I had was, oh, what, what am I going to do if I'm not in rocket science? I had to hold on to the thoughts that would then sustain the next several years of my my work and what I realized is that I have been equipped the the same type of mathematics that I used to be able to launch and, uh, the space shuttle as well as the mathematics that I teach as a mathematics professor with chaos theory is the same mathematics that could not only launch different vehicles and be in a classroom but it's the same type of mathematics that shows how we can actually reshape our own brain mm, mm. through our own thoughts. And I had to be innovative and take the information that I learned to apply in rocket launching and show someone how someone can launch their own thoughts. That's what I recognize. Yeah. And that, that's so important. I, you know, I re- I'll, I'll tell you a short story. Uh, when my daughter and son, uh, when Brian was was uh, younger, a lot younger, mm-hmm. uh, we went to uh, the New Jersey State Fair and we're walking around it and there were um, elephant rides where you got to go up on elephant and and my daughter said, oh, dad, you, you got to do this. You know, <laughs> we, we got to do the elephant ride. Yeah, we, this went on for like about three or four years, I think. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> so finally I said, uh, OK, uh, I'm going to tr- I'm going to try to do this. Uh, th- there's one thing, uh, Olympia, I'm afraid of heights. Mm hmm. Oh my God! Yeah, are, you, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid. You know, I, I mean, I'm. I'm funny really... thing is, I didn't realize uh, until we got up there how high it was. I wasn't afraid. I uh, enjoyed every minute of it. But, <laughs> I, but yeah, I, it, it was much higher than I thought. If I if I step on a, a ladder, I start to get nervous and nauseous, and and so yeah, I'm afraid of heights. You know, but um, you know, I said I was going to do this, and you can't let 
you know a little your your child down so uh, and so I, I i rode the elephant and uh they said that my face you know all the blood drained from my face and i turned white but i did it and and that became uh, known in our family any time that you had fear you know um we would say you know you got to ride the elephant Mm-hmm. You know, that, so that that's that's the term that we used is that you know you gotta you gotta understand your fear, you gotta name it as you say, and that, and then you gotta reprogram it so that you can overcome that fear. And and so uh, I thought you would find that story interesting. I so love listening to your stories. They're so great. (laughs) I I love it. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, Yeah, it's it's ride the elephant, you know. So, you know, whenever whenever you're faced with something uh, that you don't think you can do, just just ride that elephant, you know, and and uh, go forward. And and I think you're, you're saying the same thing. And that's why it resonates with me. Yes, yes, and and even even on a deeper level, and if you're on you if your your audience is really ready to hear this, fear is a thought process that we were never born with. Mm, mm. Number, it's something yeah. that we acquire in life, and we think the thoughts are our own, and it's not. Uh huh. Thoughts that are outside of us that we accept as our own, and they're not a part of us, and they've never been. Mm. We've always been courageous, powerful people. And the fear and the thought and, and the rejection or the, the, the isolation or the, the loneliness that people will experience, that's never yours. It's not. And, and, and that's what the most amazing thing is. Once we reject it, like, do you know what? I'm not alone. I have all these people who are willing to help me, and I'm going to be able to just find the right person who can. It, once we realize uh, that the rejection is not ours, when well, we realize, well, do you know what? I'm not rejected. I'm being directed to the best job for me where I will be happy. You know, when we realize that the, uh, the isolation is not ours, but rather we can actually create uh, uh, a, an empire on our own that allows people to be able to see what we can do solely, in, uh, solely in, in a, in a uh, individual fashion, that's when we gain our power, when we realize that the thought is, that thought is not ours. We have the ability to claim another thought that is far more powerful that has always been inside of us it's just waiting for you to take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what what advice would you give uh, a youngster sitting here listening to you or listening to us? And, and uh, you know, uh, they may be struggling in math. They may be struggling in another area. Um, they may be not thinking that they're they're smart. Uh, you know, and uh, I have to tell you, I was a, I was a C student most of my life, and uh, it wasn't until I got to college that uh, I became actually my senior year of high school. I, I like to say I woke up, you know, and uh, became a better student. And then uh, my first year in college, uh, that's when I really excelled. But uh, it, it was a lot of hard work to do that. So. You know, um, someone who is maybe in middle school or elementary school and may not be doing so well, what advice do you have for that? So I'm having a little, uh, I couldn't hear you completely. Uh, oh, okay. The question is, what tips do I offer people who are not doing so well? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, especially children who may be in... Uh, in middle school or elementary school or high school, uh, and, and they think, well, you know, I'm only a C student, and uh, I'm never going to get get anywhere with that. So, oh yeah, yeah, yes. I offer tips. I also I offer tips to both the kids and the parents. Well, number one, for the kids, if you're in any type of situation where you're not doing too well and you're not getting it, first things first, speak up, ask a question. 
There is no such thing as a dumb question. Every question is important. That's the only way that you learn, and that's how, the only way you know. And you can, it doesn't matter what age you are. You've got to keep that still in your being. Speak up. Ask a question. If you don't know something, don't pretend you don't know. Say, I'm so sorry. I'm not as aware with that or not as knowledgeable about that. Can you share more? Mm-hmm. Just, just speak up. Ask when you don't understand something, and that's the only way you'll find out. The, the second tip I would give for kids is, all right, who are you studying with regularly? And do you have a time that you are allowing to focus on this? Uh, most people do not recognize that when people uh, intertwine socializing and studying together, they get the information twice as much. Mm-hmm. And I realized this in graduate school when I was working with people uh, from India and in Iran and uh uh, China, the reason why we all did so well is because they, the people in other countries have this, have this skill down well. How people succeed has nothing to do with the, uh, simply the knowledge base, but it's choosing to combine socializing together with studying. And if you have an opportunity to study with your friends every single week at a certain time, that helps. If you have the ability to study with a tutor every single time, if you have the ability, uh, every single every single uh, campus, college campus, has free tutoring available. People don't know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you're like an undergraduate, um, if you, you don't even have to be just an undergraduate at the campus. It's a it's a facility that's open for students. So if there is a college close by you, find out where the mathematics tutoring lab is and take yourself, have your parents take you there, parents take your child there, just show up, see if there can be tutoring available, just show up with your son or daughter. And and most tutoring places are, on campuses, are free of charge. And that's something in which I wish someone would have told me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you're a student, uh, know which type of character you're falling into at the, uh, the website Math aphobia.com you can take the self test to find out which mathophobia you have and once you identify your mathophobia then you're able to take action steps that completely remove it from your brain and so this is actually identified in the book mathophobia which is downloadable online people can go on their iPad or cell phone or anything they want to do in addition to actually ordering it on Amazon they're able to just go and download the, the book. It's an easy read. It's a math book, and it's all in English. <laughs> Something that helps people understand what they can do, the tips. And then if you're a parent, uh, what you can do is reinstill in your child that they can do whatever it is that they want to do in life, and whatever it is that you can do to help them succeed, you will, because you have faith in what it is that they will do and contribute to the world. If you put that seed of thought in your child early on, like, do you know what? You may have failed this test, but do you know what? How can I help you so you can do well? Because I know that you can ace this test because you're a smart student and you will be able to do well in this because I have faith in your ability. Now, what about uh, somebody like me who grew up um, that was good with math, good with numbers, but not good with reading and also not good with uh, socialization? But I found uh, just some other way to get uh, the job done, and it worked. Uh, how do you um, cope with that? That's actually a brilliant dilemma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, if you're really good with the sciences, but you have a way to struggle with some other areas, uh, communication is probably the best way for you to actually uh, succeed. And through that, I mean mentorship. People who you can talk with on a regular day basis that have done what it is that you want to do. So when we when we circle and have ourselves circled around people who are moving in the direction that we want to go, it's chaotic mathematics mm. that allows us to attract on that same path. Mm. When we are around people who are focused on uh the path that we desire to take, it is by the direct proximity in mathematical relation that we naturally tend to go on that aspect. So if we have the ability to 
connect with people who are, are great at what it is that they do. And that is like the, uh, the, the best way immediately to build your own strength in doing new tasks. Wonderful, wonderful, bleh, excuse me, wonderful advice. I'm all choked up now. <laughs> I'm choked up from being on your show, too. Thank you. Uh, thank well, you thank so you, much. Sir. I feel like we only scratched the surface. We definitely have to have you back at a later date and talk some more about this. Well, w- perhaps when your 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 book, uh, Answers Unleashed, uh, premieres. Uh, or is unleashed. Unleashed. When it's unleashed, when, when, it, when it's published, uh, will you come back and uh, be a, uh, a guest oh, on I the show? I would love to come back on yeah, the I mean, show. I, I, Are you kidding I, me? This has been one of the best interviews. I love it. Oh, thank, well, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I could talk to you all day about this subject because it is it is something that I believe um, a thousand percent in. Uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, um, changing the, the brain, the changing the way people think uh, and helping them to succeed. It, it's so important. And you're doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank You're you, welcome. thank you again for being a guest on, on our show, and and uh, Olympia, you have a great weekend. What's the temperature there in in sunny California? Oh, the temperature out here is eighty degrees outside. I'm about to go to the beach. Oh, oh gosh! Man. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy, enjoy yourself. <laughs> Oh, it'll be my pleasure to come back on your show. Thank you again. Hey, thank you. Thank you. 